I should start the second panel just by saying that it is a real pleasure uh, for me to chair this panel of the CNUE conference on the implementation of the cross-border mobility directive. Uh, as uh, Juana said, in this uh, second panel, we will discuss the challenges and national approaches to the implementation of the controls on the legality. Uh, we have three participants uh, to this panel. Uh, they are coming from uh, uh, two uh, member states. Uh, we have met Cosita uh, de Vaux from Luxembourg, who I have already mentioned a few seconds ago. Maitre de Vaux uh, was appointed notary in Luxembourg in uh, 2011. And before that, uh, uh, she was uh, working closely with the ABBL, which is the Association of Luxembourg uh, uh, banks in many projects and working group uh, dealing uh, with, the with the modernization of uh, Luxembourg uh, uh, company law. Uh, today, in addition uh, to being a notary, uh, Metro de Vaux teaches uh, at the University of Luxembourg. And in her notarial role, uh, she works uh, with the Luxembourg uh, authorities, with the Luxembourg government, uh, to the implementation of uh, uh, European uh, uh, company law legislation into the Grand Duke, with particular regards to uh, topics related uh, to uh, digitalization and to understanding also uh, cross-border mobility of companies. Our uh, second uh, uh, panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Theo uh, Louis, who is currently notary in Stuttgart. Dr. Louis studied at the University of Constance and at the University of uh, Lausanne with a focus on uh, company law. He completed uh, a PhD on capital markets and uh, competition law before joining uh, uh, the notarial profession. Dr. Louis worked as a legal clerk and candidate notary in Baden-Württemberg and uh, in uh, uh, China. He has also been uh, an officer at the, general, uh, at the German Federal Ministry of Justice, at the Division for uh, uh, Company Law. Uh, a prolific writer on cross-border mobility transactions while working at the Federal Ministry of Justice, uh, Dr. Louis negotiated the, the mo mobility directive uh, for Germany in the Council uh, uh, Working Group on behalf uh, of the German head of Division for Company Law. Our last but not least uh, panelist is Dr. Peter Ries from Germany, who is a professor of uh, civil law with a focus on uh, commercial and uh, uh, company law at the Berlin School of Economics and uh, Law. Previously a lawyer, Professor Ries, is also since 1995 a judge at the uh, commercial uh, register of the district court of uh, Charlottenburg in Berlin, uh, specialized uh, again in company law. In the past, Professor Rice has been visiting a professor in important universities abroad uh, in the United States, Australia, and uh, the UK. He also advised the German parliament on the act uh, on uh, close uh, corporations at the beginning of this century. Uh, so if uh, the participants uh, to this panel agree, I would like to start, uh, to start this panel by asking each uh, of the panelists to provide us with a general outline of the current situation of the controls of legality surrounding cross-border mobility transactions in their respective member states. I suggest starting uh, with Maitre de Vaux and then uh, uh, to proceed uh, uh, with uh, our uh, German uh, uh, panelist. So if uh, Cosita agrees, uh, I give uh, the floor to her. So hello, first uh, to start, I think it's very important um, to uh, say that there are no clear answers about the new controls, but many discussions and questions. So uh, we'll, I hope that you won't be disappointed uh, because uh, we can, um, uh, as 
as of today, not giving an, an, a real light on how the controls will, will be made and especially about uh, what points controls have to be uh, done. Um, also, one um, important thing is um, to know what will be covered what companies will be covered. And so I join a little bit the discussion we had in the first panel um, that um, there are some uh, chooses to be made if uh, the directive will be implemented for all type of companies or not. Uh, Luxembourg is normally very liberal, so that's not a surprise, I think. Uh, so we have mostly the uh, politics to implement the less as possible. So not uh, to give all uh, the burden uh, for all types of uh, companies in this in this way. Uh, so um, to point out uh, the discussion point will also be a, a technical way. Uh, how to implement the directive? Will it be with a new chapter uh, about only European uh, mobility or uh, cross-border transactions, uh, including mergers, divisions, and uh, uh, conversions? Or will we just amend uh, by referral uh, the existing um, laws? Um, so that is still in discussion. Um, because as the discussion are taking uh, quite some time and coming back because the same problems uh, will be met uh, as um, for mergers uh, and the same will be the questions for the divisions uh, and nowadays also for conversions. That was not a topic before, but will be uh, right now. Uh, so it's turns that probably uh, it will be uh, limited only to uh, the, uh, the less uh, uh, possible. Uh, so it will be limited to the Société uh, de Capital. Uh, that I think is an important thing because it will be also uh, have an impact on the controls to be done. And um, as um, we are talking about controls, there are many, many questions uh, without answers, uh, especially when we have the consideration on the, uh, the point uh, 35 and 36 of uh, the directive, uh, when it comes to uh, that member states shall uh, and Article 127.8, when member states shall ensure that competent authority does not issue the pre-merger certificate where it is determined in compliance with a uh, national law that cross-border is set up for abusive or fraudulent purposes leading to or aimed uh, at the evasion uh, or circumvention of union or national law or for criminal purposes. And point nine even goes further uh, because it includes uh, a, a case by case basis and uh, may be a consultation of relevant authorities. So that are uh, discussions points. What uh, should the notary be uh, uh, the opinion uh, that uh, a transport operation will not complete, uh, has not completed all the producers and formalities, then uh, uh, we need also to uh, uh, refer and indicate the reasons uh, why we consider this and refuse uh, to establish a certificate. Uh, that was uh, not necessary uh, nowadays uh, to give a motivation. Uh, so that comes to another point of question. So what are the discussions about? Well, uh, case by case basis uh, means that uh, we need to analyze uh, every, every uh, cross-border operation. 
Um, now we always uh, were in line to have uh, timelines uh, to give a response, a quick response uh, in cross-border operations because restructuring uh, is uh, a big discussions. And so it uh, makes um, a lot of question about timing. Uh, in order to get uh, the formalities and especially the controls done. Uh, it is mentioned that there should be uh, a three months periods within uh, this can be or should be uh, established, but um, if the controls are not uh, efficient and we need uh, maybe to have more expertise and go uh, to what they call another expert uh, that will uh, give uh, a longer period uh, to have established the certificate, uh, for instance. Um, so that are thoughts around and discussions uh, are running. Um, this is a first Mm, uh, first statement. So what are the questions we have uh, with this uh, control? Well, first today, it's easy to know what we have to do. It's a legal point of view. So we have to check uh, uh, the different legal systems. Uh, is the transaction possible? Uh, and what are the legal conditions to do so? Now the verifications will go, go beyond, as it seems, beyond uh, just a legal verification. Uh, but what, that, what does that mean? Um, what are those controls about exactly? Uh, that uh, is one um, crucial question. Uh, is what is the abuse and what is the um, fraud in this case? So uh, is there a definition? Uh, in Luxembourg law, we don't have, uh, we have some definitions, but not in view of uh, mergers or uh, divisions uh, or uh, tran seed transfers. So there is also in the reflections, is there a necessity to give a definition or should it not be the right way to define, to give any such definition to what is uh, a fraud or abuse? What, 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 what is this control about? That's the main questions question where we don't have a real answer today. So reflections are, uh, when we go on a practical way, maybe we can find out what the controls can be about. So what is it possible to control? And what could be the process of control? So that is um, in the group, the state, the, the, the situation today. So there is no decisions uh, taken uh, yet, uh, but maybe uh, not in an academical way, but practical way. What can we do to ensure any such control? Um, and then we come to the other crucial question. Uh, we refer to, we can ask an expert, an expert, but who is that other expert? It's definitely not the, ed the auditor who gives us the evaluation or the report and checks uh, the exchange ratio. No, it's, it's another authority where we don't know right now who is that authority and who is aimed for. Um, so uh, being liberal, probably we won't give any definition and it will stay open. Uh, an open question uh, and just transposing and implementing the wording we have in the directive. Um, 
and giving some explanation in 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 their uh, commentary for the law um, for not uh, blocking the definition who is that expert we may need as we have also that view of case by case um, that are questions as i said we don't have any answer so the control we we feel <laughs> and i think everybody can confirm it goes beyond just legal verifications but we still don't know uh, what about and then uh uh, we have, on the other hand, uh, that notaries are obliged to enact. Uh, there are only uh, in our law foreseen two reasons not to enact when it uh, goes uh, against the criminal law or when we are money uh, laundering uh, concepts uh, or when there are incompatibilities. So we, uh, the notaries ask authority to uh, supervise and to uh, give that pre-merger certificate or uh, the certification that uh, the operation uh, is uh, in conformity lies in the responsibility from the notaries. So that raises the next question where we don't have the answer on either. Uh, what happens uh, in case of refusal? Uh, what 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 recourse? Is there recourse? Uh, that are questions, um, as I said, where uh, we are still in a plane of discussions and uh, without any answer and hoping to find some answers or some indications uh, of solutions uh, right now here in our panel. That's about the controls. Thank you very much, uh, Cosita. In fact, uh, you also touched many uh, topics that uh, I am planning to discuss more in detail in the next uh, question. But just to start, I would like uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, it is true that uh, we are moving from uh, controls that uh, appears that were pure control of legality toward controls that appear to be more controls on the merit. But uh, probably it is also true that uh, even today, the control of legality is a control of legality because uh, we receive the help uh, from other professionals to mm -hmm. carry out the control on the merit, as we're saying, the expert report on the share exchange ratio, or when you have contribution in kinds, the valuation. These are all merit, I would say, evaluations uh, that uh, then we check just uh, from a legality point of view since we receive uh, expert reports from the from the outside. I think that uh, then the problem becomes that the one you were saying, who should uh, uh, prepare a report saying this is not an abusive, this is not a circumvention. But before moving to that, I think we should uh, uh, give the floor to uh, our uh, uh, German, uh, our panelists from Germany. And uh, uh, to that purpose, I think uh, it would be uh, a right way to proceed uh, by asking uh, Dr. Louis to provide uh, an overview of the German system and then to ask Professor Ries, because uh, to my understanding, but uh, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, first the notary prepares uh, the instrument and then <laughs> the register checks it, uh, which uh, is not far from what uh, Cosita was also saying, uh, what happens if the notary is not uh, delivering uh, the, the pre-operation certificate uh, uh, is it possible to go before a judge? This is probably going to be the Italian approach because to some extent we already have a procedure like that. So Dr. Louis, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Corrado, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, I think uh, Cosita de Vaux has already touched on uh, a lot of uh, very important questions, especially uh, about uh, uh, the uncertainty uh, surrounding the definition of the anti-abuse uh, clause. Uh, I think that's a subject uh, uh, which we are all uh, uh, trying to get a, a grasp uh, on, so to speak. Um, but uh, I think we will get 
to these uh, questions, uh, I would like to start like with uh, showing a short overview of the process in Germany. Um, I have prepared a slide. Yes, exactly. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I hope you can uh, see the uh, slide now. Uh, yes, just to uh, give a short um, introduction about the uh, process in uh, Germany. Uh, I think uh, we will most likely uh, have uh, this uh, sort of uh, check uh, by the notary and then by the registry uh, caught uh, like in the current system in Germany. I have to uh, preface this by saying uh, the German ministerial draft bill for the implementation of the directive has not been uh, published. Uh, so this is um, how I think the process is going to be, uh, but uh, there's a similar process already uh, in place uh, for current uh, cross-border mergers. Um, so as you can see, um, the notary drafts or advises um, the uh, companies on the uh, drafts of the documents and notarizes uh, them uh, where necessary, uh, especially uh, draft terms of the cross-border operations and uh, uh, most um, of the times the shareholder resolution uh, as well. Uh, the notary gathers all the documents and information and uh, checks if uh, everything is uh, complete and correct. And uh, this is a, can be a rather a long process until all uh, the documentation uh, and notarization uh, is complete. And uh, then the notary uh, sends the application for the pre-operation certificate uh, to the registry court. Um, this is, of course, a simplified diagram yeah, for illustrative purposes only. So, uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, steps. Um, this is only the most important um, steps, but the notary sends electronically, uh, of course, the application for the pre-operation certificate to the registry um, court. Uh, and then uh, the registry court uh, checks uh, the documents. And ideally, um, the registry court can then uh, just go like uh, check, 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 um, uh, as uh, the registry court gets all the required uh, documents uh, from the notary in a sort of um, standardized uh, fashion and uh, can then uh, issue the uh, pre-operation certificate in a timely uh, manner, which is of course uh, the goal of the whole process and uh, obviously of the directive. Um, of course, in practice, as uh, I think uh, my colleague, um, Professor Rees uh, can <laughs> expand on this uh, point, probably in practice, um, these can be very complex operations and uh, there might be several uh, questions uh, back to the notary who might have to check back with the operating uh, companies uh, and so on. Um, and of course, the registry court can um, inquire uh, for information with other uh, relevant authorities. Uh, this is like uh, the little arrow above uh, the registry court in diagram, yeah, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, I think. Um, uh, especially if the registry court has doubts, it can uh, like gather information from other authorities like tax uh, authority uh, if it has uh, doubts about the provided uh, information. And uh, the whole aim, um, of course, of the notary in this uh, process is to advise uh, the uh, operating companies uh, to draft the documents and provide all relevant uh, information in such a way um, that the registry court can issue the pre-operation certificate. Um, now, uh, just as the last point uh, for a clarification, um, in the German system, uh, and I think this is different in some member states because I think in some member states, the notary can issue the pre-operation certificate in the German system, uh, like this, the, only the registry court can issue the pre-operation certificate. And uh, on the other hand, um, in my opinion, uh, in Germany, the notary is not uh, entitled to refuse the application um, unless in extreme cases where it's obviously for criminal purposes, then of course he can refuse. 
but uh, generally, um, uh, if the involved persons were to insist uh, that they uh, demand the notarization and the application, even if the notary uh, says this is not uh, uh, enough, um, this doesn't meet the requirements for the uh, pre-operation certificate, um, he uh, still has to send, in my opinion, the application for the pre-operation certificate to the registry court because um, in the German system, I think uh, only the registry court will be uh, the competent authority to issue the pre-operation certificate, uh, the competent authority, of course, in the meaning uh, of the directive. Um, luckily, uh, in practice, uh, this is quite rare. Usually, uh, the involved persons um, uh, are happy to oblige uh, with uh, the notary uh, on how to uh, draft the documents in su uh, such a way uh, that uh, the registry court can issue the pre-operation certificate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we should double check uh, what you just said with uh, Professor Rias. Um, so, uh, do you find the useful, <laughs> I would say, what notary do and uh, uh, do you frequently challenge uh, what uh, are their conclusions or their filings? What is the role of the registry in uh, the procedure in Germany? Thank you, Corrado. Um, of course, I find, find it useful that we have the notaries. Um, the double control system in Germany worked out very well in the past regarding company law matters because the double control is always better that, than one control. And um, regarding our, uh, as, a, as a church, uh, uh, supervision, <laughs> uh, of course, we have sometimes uh, questions as what was notarized. And of course, we play back the ball to the notaries if we have questions. And, um, it depends a little bit on the kind of notaries uh, we have, so-called only notaries, which only notarize, and we have so-called attorney notaries. And if you look at the only notaries, we have a very good qualification. Now. But let me come to the topic and maybe uh, I just want to add to the first panel and um, to the open issues uh, regarding the, uh, the, the uh, directive. Uh, and as um, my colleagues put forward uh, before, uh, there are open issues whether the directive is applicable or whether the transformation of the directive of national law should also be extended to partnerships. And in Germany, we have a strong uh, view that it should be extended to cross-border conversions and divisions of partnerships as well. We even have case law in Germany, which opens that right now, uh, the extension to partnerships. And the second thing, uh, this extension of the scope to divisions to existing companies, huh? that the receiving company is an existing company. I can only agree with my colleagues in the first panel that uh, this is the usual way of a division, uh, that a receiving company is an already existing company. And I hope uh, that the German legislator would open that in the German act on conversion, both uh, the extension to partnerships and uh, the extension to the uh, division on pre-existing um, companies. Um, in German pre-merger law, we have this extension to partnerships. Huh? So I'm rather positive that the German legislator will extend uh, the, uh, the cross-border uh, um, division and the cross-border um, um, conversion to partnerships as well. Um, but uh, coming back to our panel, um, of course, uh, the evident open issue is the control issue. And as was said before, of course, if we read the language of the directive, uh, if I only look at the term abusive, uh, what is abusive? <laughs> um, can we say, for example, as the discussion was uh, uh, some years ago, uh, the division of uh, separation of the actual and the administrative seat is abusive. Huh? Uh, what is it? Huh? What is it abusive? How, uh, where does it refer to? I think this open term must be defined in the national laws because we cannot work with this 
a term. Uh, we can work with the term fraudulent in criminal purposes uh, because we have a definition of fraud and we have a, a definition of crimes. Uh, that I think is not a problem, but the term abusive is a real problem. Uh, the next problem on the term law is maybe what is the competent authority? Of course, in the first instance, uh, the registry court in Germany should be the competent authority uh, to control if there is any fraudulent uh, abuse here for criminal purposes. Huh? Uh, but uh, under the German system, we also have the notaries. Huh? Uh, can we extend this uh, this term competent authority to the notaries as well? Um, maybe this is a good idea because the notary is, a, is closer to the, to, the, to the shareholders and to the directors, and maybe he has more information on that. The next question uh, for the control of abusive fraudulent and criminal purposes, of course, uh, where, where, where can we find out this information? Shall we only rely on the documents or on the reports, which by the way can be waived? <laughs> then we have, do not have any reports and, and don't, we don't have any information. Shall we rely on the documents? I doubt and I, I wonder whether there's any information on the documents in the plan uh, regarding criminal or fraudulent or abusive purposes, there will be no information. Next information, next question, where shall we turn for information? Uh, of course, uh, Theo mentioned that as a registry court, I have the possibility uh, to go to my national authorities like tax authorities or social insurance um, agencies. Uh, I can do that, of course, uh, uh, but I think uh, maybe I have also to turn to another uh, the, to authority in the, in, a, in the other country. Yeah? And uh, do I get information from authorities of the other countries? I doubt that. Yeah? And what happens if I do not get any information? Yeah? Uh, how shall I go uh, further then? Yeah? Um, I don't have any clue about that. So I must be honest yeah, for the moment. Yeah? Um, my idea, and that's my final comment on this, uh, wouldn't it be uh, interesting to have in national laws a kind of affidavit of the applying directors where they at least um, uh, make a statement in the application that this cross-border conversion or division is not uh, construed for uh, fraudulent or criminal purposes. And um, we would have that in the uh, in the application, which is certified by the notaries, uh, and we could impose uh, a, a criminal penalty uh, if uh, the affidavit is false. Uh, we have a, kind, a similar kind of uh, affidavit for our directors, uh, uh, which under, who under German law uh, cannot be directors if they are um, um, if they are, if they have any criminal penalty, like for example, planet, uh, fraud, and uh, with German directors, they must um, put this affidavit in the application as well. Maybe can we can do the same with uh, application of cross-border conversions and divisions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, we are all, uh, I would say, struggling with the same uh, similar questions. And um, again, uh, the idea of an affidavit is something really interesting. The other approaches I heard uh, so far were, for example, uh, as also Cosita was uh, saying, uh, to uh, limit uh, the control uh, to the information that were made available uh, to the competent authority. Or another uh, approach that I heard was to uh, say that the pre-operation certificate is delivered uh, to the best knowledge of the competent authority. Uh, but for sure, uh, I see that also being a registrar is not uh, easy to deal uh, uh, with these problems. Maybe I would like to ask you, what is the type of controls you carry out now? They are uh, only legality control or also the merit um, practically uh, is this new uh, directive introducing something completely new for you, or uh, you, to some extent you already carry out some uh, controls on the merit? This is for Professor Rios again. 
Uh, of course, uh, our control extends to the legal correctness. So, uh, are the shareholders' resolutions correct? Uh, are they uh, legally correct according to the standards in, in the national law, which will be very similar to the, um, the provisions in the directive? And of course, we, we, uh, we control the formal requirements as, uh, for example, the notary requirements. So, and of course, uh, under our control system in the courts, we are not allowed to entry fraudulent or, uh, uh, or um, criminal acts in the register. That is, of course, true. Um, but coming back to the term abusive, uh, we do not have any, anything yet here in our uh, German law uh, about abusive com company law matters, but we don't have it. Thank you very much. In fact, in Italy, for example, uh, we have a definition of abuse, but just for tax law purposes. So uh, probably a first port of call uh, for us uh, would be to uh, some extent uh, see to what extent that see to what uh, extent that definition can also be used to frame the abuse uh, in, the, in the directive. But uh, maybe I would like to ask to uh, Cosita: Is there uh, any definition uh, of abuse, any definition of uh, fraud? in Luxembourg law that you think may be considered relevant? Because of something that I've been told by a person that was closely involved in the adoption of the directive was that, in fact, at the European level, there is not even a definition of abuse. And so probably the reference to the abuse under European law is a definition that is not I would say really meaningful. I would like also to ask your, your opinion on this. Maybe we start with Cosita, then we go to Theo, and then we come back to Professor Ries. Uh, for me, in my, my view, there is no clear definition in, in our national law, uh, company law for abuse or fraud, except uh, the notion abus de biens sociaux. Uh, when you use uh, the company's um, um, assets uh, for personal or uh, other um, other um, use than uh, in the objective of the company. So it's uh, from the French system. Um, our fear- well, Thank I you very much. In the discussions we had, we, we also, thought about is there a definition on the European level and well we might think of duck six uh, or or attack or all those uh, new <laughs> concepts but still there is not really a definition that could apply in this uh, situation so um uh, we are the opinion that there is not a, a definition right now. And you don't want to introduce it? Okay. Theo? Uh, uh, the problem is we don't know what, uh, what it could be. We neither. Uh, it's Theo. <laughs> Yes, uh, that is exactly uh, the problem I think we all uh, face. Um, uh, in Germany, as uh, Professor Ries has uh, pointed out already, there's currently no uh, general anti-abuse clause in the German Transformation Act. Um, but of course, uh, there are general principles of uh, civil law, um, uh, like uh, 138, 242 German Civil Code, uh, which state like legal transactions contrary to public policy, uh, are void and there's a duty to perform according to the requirements of good faith, so also very undefined um, clauses. I think these general principles of civil law also uh, apply um, uh, for the um, uh, German Transformation Act um, and for cross-border operations. Um, but uh, still, I think um, these uh, general principles will not be 
sufficient uh, for uh, the implementation of the directive. I think the national legislator uh, and uh, as I've mentioned before, um, the ministerial draft bill has not yet been published, but I think the national legislator um, will have to implement uh, a more um, sort of defined anti-abuse clause uh, in the German Transformation Act. Um, but on the other hand, I think this uh, anti-abuse clause can still be only be a general clause because I think the national legislator will also not be able to give a really uh, defined answer on this question. Thank you very much, Professor Rias. I agree with Theo. Of course, we have this general clauses in the German Civil Code, uh, but we, to these clauses, we have hundreds of uh, court decisions. <laughs> what is immoral? What is uh, against good faith? Um, I think we must, uh, must have a very narrow clause in the conversion law. Right? When we have that, and it's too broad and too to to be applicable in the practice. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that this is a problem um, everywhere, and that we are all, uh, to some extent, uh, trying to find a viable approach that will be able uh, to allow companies to enjoy the cross-border mobility they are entitled to, and uh, also to ensure that. Uh, we comply with the directive and the additional safeguards that have been uh, introduced. I would like to remind that uh, uh, obviously the participants uh, are uh, invited if they wanted to ask questions in uh, our uh, um, chat. And um, um, moving uh, again uh, uh, to um, some uh, uh, other topics that are, however, still closely related to. Um, Again, the control surrounding the issuance of the pre-operation um, uh, certificate. I would like to ask the panelists if they can uh, uh, give us uh, their uh, opinions, their impressions on uh, uh, what will happen once uh, the directive is uh, implemented with regard to the controls concerning the protection of creditors, the protection of uh, shareholders, the protection of uh, employees. Because uh, uh, also from this point, I think uh, the competent authority will have additional uh, uh, work to do. And uh, in uh, general, the procedure is becoming, uh, in my perspective, uh, more burdensome. Uh, for example, uh, uh, making reference uh, to transactions that we normally carried out from uh, Italy to Luxembourg, from Luxembourg to Italy, cross-border, what are, are now cross-border conversions can be arranged quite quickly, while as also Cosita was saying, this will take probably more time in the future. So also the controls regarding these, these transactions with some extent change. So um, I give uh, the floor to Cosita. Uh, what are your impressions regarding these, uh, these new, I would say, controls? Yeah, there will be uh, surely additional uh, concerns. Um, uh, they are not clear right now in Luxembourg. We had uh, a lot of to do with the digitalization. So, um, discussions uh, were uh, just started uh, shortly uh, and we are waiting for instance for all what is employees uh, to get some more information uh, from the ministry uh, uh, in charge of uh, 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 that um, so they turned back uh, in order to know what uh, th their view is what uh, should be uh, 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 controls. Um, there are options. That is the point three in the article. So as we are liberal, uh, we uh, will probably take options uh, not to include everything. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, uh, the, um, the other uh, concern uh, to um, um, uh, 
where we also wait uh, to get feedback uh, from the reflection group um, that are all what is uh, the right for shareholders uh, to uh, sell uh, their uh, shares, the minority shareholders to sell their shares uh, uh, back to the company, um, what is not uh, traditional in Luxembourg law. So there where we had uh, first the point, uh, how do we implement that idea of uh, the minority shareholders and uh, to have the opportunity, uh, the possibility when they are not, they are not agree to the operations to sell their, uh, uh, sell their shares. Um, if this has to be implemented for all type, also the national uh, mergers. Uh, um, so there we had some uh, discussion to coming to the conclusion that once again, we will uh, probably move to a European chapter and a national chapter uh, in order not to change uh, too much the Luxembourg um, way to work in company law and restructuring uh, in order to keep as much uh, the cultural background we have right now, like also for our definition of the seat of the companies so when we're coming to the conversions. Uh, so um, there too, uh, we uh, have uh, some reflection and uh, on this point, probably we will get in the next two weeks uh, um, more um, precise ideas there they are uh, starting to draft. And then uh, it's easier to comment to see what, what will that really uh, imply uh, for the notary to control as we are the controlling the supervising authority for the uh, transactions. Um, then we have uh, in that uh, in that idea there were also the discussion is it only the shareholders or only shares is it only or is it uh, also other vo uh, voting uh, participation in in the company uh, but it will uh, as usual be uh, as less burdenful uh, so it will really be only the shareholders uh, with voting shares. Um, uh, and the uh, directive in our reading doesn't uh, go further uh, and we will stick to what is foreseen in, in the directive. Uh, then we talked also about, so we had the shared creditors, yeah. <laughs> there uh, we had also a lot of discussions, as probably everybody. Um, First, uh, there are other um, periods than we have nowadays. We're moving to three months. Uh, now we have two months for the creditors to uh, get uh, or request some securities. And the main point will be when does this uh, period run? When does it start? Uh, now in Luxembourg, no, it only starts uh, when we publish the general meeting. Uh, that is not always the same for the participating uh, country. So there will be uh, now uh, in the new implementation where also uh, that view to get a, a clear idea, when does it start? When is the period uh, terminated in order to make sure uh, that it uh, has finished and uh, also uh, an important thing like in Belgium, it's suspensive. Uh, in Luxembourg, it's not suspensive. So uh, uh, that has to be cleared. And that will be finally also uh, the interesting discussions uh, when we are having the transactions in order to make sure that for both or all the countries, uh, all the periods uh, is really uh, respected and uh, creditors had uh, been in the possibility to uh, secure their rights. Uh, there will, is one other point uh, where we had also a discussion about for what, uh, not the period, but the, the um, 
the debt itself, when, uh, when uh, does it, uh, is it um, accessible uh, uh, at the moment when the period starts or is it enough when it gets uh, due during the period? So that might be also uh, something uh, where uh, more explanations will be needed in, in, in the drafting or at least in the commentary of the further articles. If there are changes uh, with respect of the existing situation or differences with national law or transactions with uh, non-EU non -EU, non -EU countries uh, and to stress if there are differences. Today, we are not sure about Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, we, we have a similar problems because uh, to my understanding, we are moving toward an approach. Uh, this, this is what is suggested by the directive that is more in line with the German tradition. So uh, essentially an ex-ante uh, creditor protection, uh, which is not blocking, uh, while for example, in Italy it is exposed. So after the general meeting decision and uh, the opposition of the creditors will block the transaction. And uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, these uh, uh, two ways uh, Italian law has to deal with this problem should change in implementing the directive. But it's interesting to know that in Luxembourg, we are having a, a similar dis discussion and you keep the two possibilities open. And it will be interesting also to see to what extent uh, you can reconcile that with the text of the directive. But uh, um, maybe uh, we should uh, ask uh, also our uh, um, co-panelists what is their impression. My general, uh, I would say, idea of uh, the approach in Germany to cross-border mobility was that uh, traditionally the German law didn't favor much this cross-border uh, mobility transaction, but this changed uh, recently. And uh, I think that in the past, the procedure reflected this, uh, uh, this favor toward this, um, this transaction, uh, being sure that they were carried out only after all interests were completely uh, settled. Again, this is just an impression from Buddha and uh, no offense. Is, uh, is meant, uh, but uh, uh, with, with the implementation of the new uh, directive, uh, do you think that there will be additional protections that will be introduced for creditors, employees, and uh, shareholders, or will uh, the uh, framework of the protection uh, remain similar to what we have now, being aware of the fact that the directive has some uh, new, I would say, uh, additional burdens that have been introduced. So maybe uh, we start uh, this time with Professor Ries and then uh, with uh, Dr. Louis. Um, first, um, um, there was some reluctance in the past uh, for cross-border um, conversions, of course, uh, but after the ECJ decisions of uh, Paul Wood and Wale, we had many decisions in my practice as a judge. I have it every week, huh? one conversion, huh? even without a national law, huh? only with uh, the rules and the directive. Uh, second, to your second question, I expect that the German legislator will, um, will have similar provisions as to the protections of creditors, shareholders, and employees as in the German um, cross-merger law. We have that in the cross-merger law, and we have that in the uh, law for the Societas Europea. Um, and I think it will be very similar. And I think the provisions in the German law, but also in the directive, they are rather sophisticated. And I can imagine that this will work out for cross-border conversions and divisions as well. That is my impression. I don't have, uh, we don't have the, the, the draft yet, uh, but we have the, the provisions as to the cross border merger law. And I think that will be 
rather similar you know, for the conversions and the emissions. Dr. Louis? Um, yes, I um, agree with uh, my colleague uh, that uh, I think, that of course, there will have to be some uh, changes, uh, but uh, I think it's mostly a sensible framework uh, in the directive. Um, uh, and, of course, the main point is uh, it's great to have a framework, even if it's not uh, obviously not perfect. Um, but. Uh, it's very good to have uh, any uh, regulation um, and um, I think problems uh, in the directive uh, with the um, shareholders, creditors and employees uh, protections are mostly come from um, that uh, some regulations are a bit too complex and convoluted. Um, of course, um, especially regarding, in my opinion, uh, the um, protection of the um, employee uh, coup de determination, which is in uh, Germany a huge, uh, very uh, big uh, political um, problem uh, regarding uh, cross border transformations or cross border operations. And um, I think uh, for this reason, um, um, for Germany, um, cross border operations with uh, coup determined. Um, Companies will be much, uh, much more difficult uh, than uh, with uh, companies who are not uh, co determined. Um, but um, of course, it's uh, the result of a political uh, compromise, uh, the directive. Uh, so it's uh, understandable that some rules might be a bit um, convoluted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since uh, Professor Rias mentioned the cross-border mergers involving uh, European companies, I dare to ask him uh, uh, to what extent uh, uh, the implementation of the directive will have an impact on this, uh, could have an impact in Germany in uh, this type of cross-border mergers. Because um, in fact, in the past, uh, we, we had discussions where uh, we were considering uh, uh, the mergers governed by the regulation on European companies uh, not really affected by the, by the cross-border mobility directive. And uh, since this new directive introduces, uh, as we have seen, some additional safeguards uh, for all the stakeholders involved. And while the regulation on the European company doesn't really go in the details, I know that in Germany you have uh, this uh, legislation that to some extent implements the regulation. Um, do you think that uh, uh, you will continue to have a dual track? So one for European companies and one for cross-border uh, transaction involving national entities? or the two tracks will uh, come together? Because to my understanding, they are really, in, at least in Germany, operating on two different uh, legal, uh, legal framework. I hope you, I got your question right. Um, what we can observe is that we only have less cross-border mergers uh, after the ECH, ECH decisions, and because of course, cross-border conversions are from a tax perspective, uh, more positive. Huh? Uh, and I expect when we have the transfer to the directive transfer into the national law, of course, uh, the number of cross-border conversions will even be larger huh? and uh, cross-border mergers will be uh, not necessary for restructuring purposes, for example. Huh? And um, I hope I got your question right. That is my first input for this. Huh? Yes, thank you. I mean, I was also making reference to the, to the European companies, the Societas Europaea, because uh, this was traditionally a tool. And uh, with this new directive, do you think it will be more used or less used in the end? I see. You, you mean the SE, the European Societas yeah. Europaea? Um, 
from my point of view, I think the Societas Europea is a, a nice marketing tool as well. And so it looks better to have a European society than a German or a French society. No? And I wonder whether this will be uh, the conversion uh, directive will be the reason for uh, for abolishing or for not going into a you know? uh, from the numbers right now it's the same huh? we have as ease as we had before uh, but uh, we have more conversions now huh? but the number of establishment of new SEs is not uh, less than before huh? right now Cosita, do you have may maybe a Luxembourg perspective? Uh, because uh, again, it seems to me that uh, it could become really burdensome uh, from a Luxembourg perspective, the procedure and the European company can be considered a kind of tool. The European company was not really a big hit in Luxembourg uh, as uh, you still have to comply with uh, uh, Luxembourg law. It's not really a European company. And when we had conversions, well, transfer seats, uh, it was very, very burdensome. Uh, now, maybe as uh, the conversion, the uh, cross-border conversion will be more burdensome, maybe we will have more SE, I don't know. Uh, maybe thoughts, because there we have to publish uh, for two months uh, uh, the proposal for the transfer of seat and um, that's why uh, I, I had a lot of uh, seat transfers uh, to different countries, uh, but for SE only thir uh, three. Uh, there are really not, uh, not many uh, SE compared to other corporate forms. Well, in Italy, we have three SEs in total, so <laughs> not even three transfers. So, uh, uh, Dr. Louis, would you like to add something or? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, in German, it's kind of a German specialty, the uh, strong laws on uh, employee code determination. And I think the uh, reason why the uh, SE is uh, relatively popular in Germany, especially with uh, big uh, companies, uh, has not so much to do with uh, cross-border um, operations, uh, but more uh, with the fact that uh, the uh, laws uh, on employee code determination um, are more favorable for the shareholders, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, than uh, in the German uh, stock corporation. By the way, just to add, um, we have much more SEs uh, than you have in Luxembourg. I think we have about 400 in Germany, even the big ones are like Porsche and Allianz uh, insurance. Uh, and uh, it is rather complicated uh, from a notary view and from a uh, judge view uh, to, to incorporate such an SE. Um, we even have uh, shelf SEs. Uh, there are some providers of shelf SEs, and that is what I meant. What I meant with the marketing purpose. Uh, it's nice to have something European, <laughs> at least in Germany. <laughs> well, the three transfer seat transfer I had went to Germany, so <laughs> the SEs transferred uh, uh, the seat to Germany because I think. It's really uh, something that uh, is uh, Korean with German law and uh, in, in, in the tradition. So, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just, just one more comment. Please, please. Uh, from a German perspective, of course, uh, as uh, Theo put it, uh, it has something to do with code determination uh, with the one tier and two tier system. And of course, uh, for some investors, uh, they don't want to have the two tier system and then they can go to the SE yeah? under German rules, of course, as well. Yes, these are the two typical rationale behind the adoption of uh, the SE in Germany for determination, uh, freezing the co-determination rules and uh, adopting the one tier uh, board structure. Uh, 
But moving uh, to uh, coming back to our uh, controls uh, and uh, talking uh, about uh, uh, Directive uh, 2121, one of the important features of the directive is that we will have uh, to exchange documents uh, with uh, the BRIS, uh, the Business Register Interconnection uh, uh, System. Uh, in these days, uh, at least in Italy, we are implementing uh, uh, Directive 1151 of 2019. Uh, and uh, uh, there you can see uh, some practical uses of the BRIS with regard in particular to the exchange of documents concerning the branches. And uh, we are facing uh, some practical uh, uh, problems. Um, one problem that was also discussed at the European level uh, was that uh, uh, that in some member states uh, it is still needed uh, uh, an apostille uh, in order to exchange documents. And uh, uh, the BRIS uh, uh, regulation and uh, the directives governing the BRIS uh, do not provide for an exemption from the duty of uh, obtaining an apostille. So the question for you uh, would be, is this uh, apostille or this legalization formality still needed in uh, your country? And uh, if it is, uh, would, uh, how can uh, the BRIS practically work in practice? Do you expect to introduce some exemptions from the duty of obtaining an apostille? I think we can start with Cosita because I already know the answer. <laughs> uh, so, and it will be quite quick, I guess. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if I have the correct answer. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, we, we do not really exchange uh, uh, the pre uh, the certificate right now through the system. That's one first uh, uh, start. Um, uh, but I know that uh, our national trade register is working on getting more information uh, in the system and so that it uh, the interconnection uh, will be moving and being more uh, efficient. Um, we work with a lot and many apostilles. So uh, we still have an, an, a real world and not uh, only a virtual world, but we're working on getting more digitalization. Was that the expected answer? Yes, also that, uh, I mean, you can, it is up to the notary to decide uh, if a foreign document can uh, be considered authentic or not, and there is not uh, strictly a need uh, for obtaining yeah. an apostille. It's, it's when we are expecting documents uh, from uh, colleagues uh, from other countries, it depends on the relation, if we know them well or, uh, in fact, we, we are requesting an loan when there are doubts or when we don't know uh, uh, the partners uh, for that transaction uh, that were. So I think we can move to Professor Rias. Uh, when you receive a pre-operation certificate, a pre-merger certificate, it should be apostilled in Germany and uh, in the future, will it be apostilled again or? Uh, that depends a little bit on the country because uh, in Germany we have uh, some treaties with several other member states in the European Union where we waive apostille. Uh, there are many countries like Belgium and France that we waive them. Some, and the German courts, uh, I hope Theo has the same um, experience. And the most German company courts do not ask for any apostille, for example, for uh, documents from, from France and Germany. Uh, France and Belgium. Um, but of course, there are still countries even in the, in the, in the European Union uh, where we need the apostille for, uh, uh, for uh, documents. And I don't think that we will weigh that uh, because of the conversion directive. It would be preferable. No? At least it would be preferable to have an electronic apostille. No? And that should be the solution then, no? I guess. No? Um, 
German company courts work with the briefs, uh, but not with the, uh, the certificate, but uh, for uh, the publication purposes. Uh, if we entry, uh, uh, for example, a cross border merger, uh, we uh, use the briefs for the publication of the entry. And, of, and I think that will be um, extended to cross border current versions and divisions as well. No? But right now, it's only for cross border merges. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, there is also a bilateral uh, convention between Germany and Italy regarding the exemption from the apostille. Um, Theo, would you like to, to, to add something? Do you think that uh, this apostille uh, is a serious problem and this uh, electronic apostille would be an valuable alternative uh, to the paper apostille uh, that we all know? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I mean, in the current situation, as already mentioned um, by uh, Professor Rees, um, uh, there are some uh, like uh, international treaties with, with uh, certain states, like for example, Austria, which we have a lot here in southern uh, Germany uh, contact with, where, we, uh, where it is just completely waived uh, uh, the apostille. But um, like uh, with the member states uh, where uh, there is not uh, such a uh, waiver on a state treaty level, we still need uh, the epistille in my opinion, and uh, the mobility directive uh, doesn't change that. I think uh, the key really lies, as already mentioned by Professor Rees, uh, um, in uh, the solution that we need uh, an electronic uh, epistille, like um, we have to have a framework um, uh, so uh, that we don't need uh, the paper uh, anymore. And um, I think maybe via some sort of blockchain ever still. Uh... But uh, more in general, with regard to the Greece, uh, uh, do you face any difficulties uh, at present in Germany with the use of the Greece? Because, for example, some colleagues. Uh, told us that, for example, they had some uh, cross-border mergers that were blocked because uh, the companies involved in the transactions didn't have uh, the European identification number. Uh, so quite technical uh, issues uh, concerning the exchange of documents between registers. Uh, and this obviously, I mean, uh, if it is a, a branch of a small company, maybe it's not a big issue, but when you have a multi-billion uh, merger between two banks, it can be something quite uh, problematic. What is your, uh, your impression on how the breeze is working at present? It's working better, at least. <laughs> uh, uh, speaking for the, uh, for the Berlin court, uh, we had these technical problems, uh, exactly, we had these te technical problems in the past, huh? um, but I just talked to my, uh, to my people there in the, in the court and they said it works now with almost most, uh, almost all of the countries in the European member states. Huh? When I see the list here, I think we have 27 countries listed here and it works right now. Huh? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have uh, five minutes. Uh, uh, we don't have uh, uh, questions from uh, from uh, the from the participants, uh, and so maybe I would like to ask you a last uh, um, question uh, regarding, uh, I would say, really the practice of uh, cross-border operations, because in fact. Taking a, as a model the cross-border merger, uh, the competent authorities involved uh, uh, both uh, in the uh, in delivering the, the pre-operation certificates of the different companies involved, but also as the uh, authority in charge of carrying out uh, the final uh, control of legality. Um, from uh, I would say my um, practical uh, experience. Uh, uh, even if the three controls uh, seem similar in practice, they are quite different. And uh, probably the control that is more delicate is the one of the company 
uh, is the one concerning the uh, pre-operation certificate of the company that is leaving its jurisdiction. Uh, do you think that uh, these three controls are equivalent, are similar, or uh, there are also some uh, practical differences between the controls you carry out in these, uh, in these transactions? Uh, if you have a company that is outgoing, incoming, uh, or uh, if it stays in your jurisdiction. Uh, so how do you approach uh, your role uh, in this transaction uh, as a notary in Germany? Uh, I hope I understood uh, the question correctly, like um, as far as uh, the difference between uh, incoming and outgoing operations is concerned, I absolutely agree, like the um, controls uh, on the outgoing uh, companies are uh, much more uh, difficult uh, and complex uh, regarding the process um, uh, until uh, you uh, get the pre-operation certificate uh, because there's a lot more um, to check regarding uh, the safeguards um, uh, regarding minority shareholders, creditors, employees, uh, and as mentioned in Ger Germany, always a big, uh, uh, big question: the uh, employee code determination. Um, uh, so uh, this is, can be a very complex um, uh, control. Uh, meanwhile, on the other hand, like the company uh, coming uh, to uh, your member state, uh, it's mostly. A uh, question of uh, whether uh, the uh, rules on uh, founding a company uh, are um, uh, fulfilled, uh, like uh, having a certain amount of uh, capital uh, and so on. But uh, uh, this is uh, obviously not as complex as uh, the other way around. Thank you very much. Professor Ries, which type of transaction you would be more likely to block? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I totally agree with uh, Theo. And I think, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the certificate is the most important uh, of the outgoing country. And, um, but speaking from a point as a church, uh, if a company comes to us to Germany, of course, in the, in the beginning, we, uh, as German, judges or German lawyers, we were a little bit hesitant to, to accept uh, such kind of certificates, huh? for example, in cross-border mergers, because, um, of course, uh, we, we did not know exactly is that correct, the certificate is, is it not correct, but that was the past. Huh? After four years now in practice with cross-border conversions, even without national law, uh, we, we we get these certificates and we rely on that. Huh? The certificates of a Luxembourg notary, of course, I rely on that, that this is correct and that this is checked correctly. Huh? And so we don't cast any doubts on that huh, in practice. Thank you very much. And so we conclude with the Luxembourg notary, with Cosita. <laughs> Do you think, uh, you think your, the role are different uh, and you see problems uh, more when you're delivering pre-operation certificate or when you're carrying out your final control? Uh, I think it's more when company is leaving. Uh, it's uh, a little bit the same view. So uh, making sure that everything has been respected uh, before leaving the country and that it will be um, adopted or uh, merged uh, in the correct uh, uh, form and way and in respect of uh, the legal prescriptions. Uh, so it's important uh, to, uh, when we establish the pre, uh, uh, the pre, the certificate uh, uh, before. The same will be uh, also when it comes to Luxembourg that it has been correctly decided and that all the controls has been made, but uh, uh, leaving the country um, is always um, uh, stricter in control uh, as um, the decision uh, to, to, to make sure that um, everything has been correct by uh, taking the decision. 
knowing that now, well, for merger, it was already uh, the quorum and the majority to vote, that we don't have the unanimity anymore for uh, the nationality, for the change of nationality since 2016. So before it was really uh, a an, 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 an very big discussion uh, when uh, companies were leaving and it was not in a merger uh, situation. And so um, again, uh, establishing uh, the uh, certificate in order to get the company to another country uh, is more burdensome than checking if everything is fine uh, to uh, make them coming to the country. May I much, ask, Professor may, Mies, please? May I ask a question uh, to my Luxembourg colleague? Are there any resentments against uh, German court certificates in your state? Huh? Do you know of, of that, uh, resentments? Um, we had to get used to it. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, well, it's, it's uh, uh, always uh, the question of knowing the documentation, making sure that uh, uh, that is the right uh, document and that all the information is inside that it that it should have uh, in the German point of view. But uh, once you had one, two, uh, it's 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 e easier. Well, uh, for any um, merger or transfer conversion, uh, when it's the first time you're working with another country, it's uh, it's more. Uh, burdensome as you don't know uh, the documentation that can be delivered and uh, you don't you're not really sure what it should all what information it includes uh, I remember I had also a merger not now in the new framework but in the old framework there, there was there were many discussions about translations and that is now with the bridge system a little bit easier but before uh, we couldn't uh, get the company um, deregistered in Luxembourg because the confirmation didn't come in a uh, language uh, uh, our trade register accepted. And they didn't want to translate. Uh, so it was, it was a quite a funny situation because uh, finally, uh, we said, well, we get an official translation here in Luxembourg and finally we, we informed the trade register that the merger had been completed. But it was just because of the language, so because they weren't used to that communication. That is a problem that they've solved uh, uh, for the future, uh, the language problem with the British system. That is a good thing. And, and that would be something for the national legislator in transforming the directive now to put in some wording in the national law saying the certificates must also be in English huh? as the lingua franca huh? would be something to address for the national legislator. I think uh, that's a good idea to, well, to indicate what language the certificate has to be or if it has to be translated uh, with an official translator. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not only the apostille, but also the language uh, mm -hmm. can be an, an issue. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> we have a question from a Professor Zib from Austria. Uh, he asked if a notary signs uh, with, with uh, his official electronic uh, notarial signature, is, is there still a need for uh, an apostille? Um, from uh, an Italian perspective, uh, I would say the answer is yes, mm, as long as it goes to a country where an apostille is needed. And uh, if, uh, for example, a foreign uh, notary signs uh, with a, an IDAS certificate, uh, uh, an electronic document, I think we will have to extract that, verify the signature, and also obtain a, an apostille from abroad, which would be probably even more difficult <laughs> than having it on a paper document. Uh, but uh, what uh, would be your answer? 
I can start if you are fine with that. Please. Um, that is uh, a, a, a part of the discussion included in, in, in the digitalization. Uh, are we allowed to accept um, uh, for, sig for documents provided uh, with a um, um, digital signature where the law says it's, it's, it's uh, when it's either uh, then it's similar to and to be assimilated to a an, uh, an handwritten signature. Uh, so we should be able to accept it, but I think it's was it will now it's still a technical issue in order to check that this is really to have the certificate to to be able to check the validity of that signature um now with the digitalization of uh, our deeds of the uh, we Imagine that we can check the signature and also certify that that signature at that moment was the digital signature of that person. And then we could even get on that basis an apostille if needed. Um, we only have the draft bill, so we don't have any comments on the draft bill yet. It has been uh, published uh, a few days ago. So looking forward to get the, the, the final answer to that proposal. Professor Ries. Um, welcome, Mr. Zip. Uh, I hope to see you in, in Vienna <laughs> this year. Um, but I think uh, we would still um, ask for the apostille because the apostille is necessary for documentation that the person is a notary. <laughs> um, and, I think if you do not have a waiver in a treaty with the respective member states, we should we would still ask for the apostle. Well, in fact, the in fact the apologies, but I don't know who is calling him. But in fact, the um, the new initiative of the Commission upgrading digital company law has some interesting proposal regarding the possibility of abolishing the apostille when documents are exchanged via the BRIS. Maybe it could also be by using electronic signatures or as notaries would like, using secure platforms, maybe also organized by the CNUE. So essentially, uh, ensuring tools that are uh, uh, tools that uh, allow a, I would say an exchange of documents in a secure way that uh, would create a level of, of trust comparable to that created by the apostille. But for sure to do that, we will need uh, legislation uh, at the European or at the national level. Um, I think we are uh, running uh, out of time, so maybe I ask uh, also um, the participant in the first panel and uh, also the panelists uh, in the second panel if they have any other uh, question, any other remark they would like to make uh, um, to, uh, before we move to the conference. Otherwise, uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank uh, um, the two of you for uh, taking the time to participate in this uh, in the second uh, panel. And uh, I think we can uh, to the uh, conclusions uh, of this uh, interesting uh, uh, seminar. Um, it was a very uh, fruitful uh, uh, discussion for me. And uh, I should say that when we planned to hold this uh, conference, we decided to invite uh, uh, the Commission to deliver the uh, concluding uh, remarks. Uh, however, the officials of the Commission told us that unfortunately they were not able uh, to join us uh, in our conference today because uh, it focuses on the transposition of uh, the directive and not on the adoption <laughs> of uh, the directive. Mm -hmm.
So uh, I guess it would be now up to me to uh, wrap up things and uh, say the final words of this event. Uh, well, uh, first conclusion that I think we can draw is that now it's really up to us in the member states uh, to make the directive uh, work. It's up to us in our working groups. Uh, many of the persons that took the floor today uh, are directly involved in the transposition of the directive. And I think it is really important to have uh, venues uh, where we can exchange information uh, also uh, somewhat informally. Um, in uh, our working group in Italy, uh, to some extent, we are, we are trying to create ties with other uh, working groups. Uh, but uh, if you then move uh, to ministries, uh, it is uh, really, I would say, uh, diplomatic. So uh, it takes a lot of time. And uh, it is also important that these exchange are effective. So it is probably a good idea also to have a kind of scientific events as we tried uh, to have uh, uh, today. Uh, I think that uh, we had a very interesting uh, uh, clues on what is going on uh, in the different member states. Uh, and uh, if uh, we uh, see what uh, was happening um, in the first panel, we had uh, many interesting remarks regarding uh, to what extent we should extend the scope of the directive to partnership, to divisions into pre-existing companies, uh, to what extent uh, insolvency and restructuring procedures should matter uh, when uh, we are dealing with cross-border uh, mobility uh, transactions. And also, finally, we also touched the point uh, of uh, uh, the legal personality, the continuity of the existence of um, uh, the company that is uh, moving into another jurisdiction. And uh, this is a sensitive topic uh, that uh, I think uh, once we will have implemented the, the directive uh, fully, we'll come back to some extent. Uh, in the, our second panel, on the other end, uh, we address probably what is at present the most delicate problem uh, in the implementation, uh, that is that of uh, the controls uh, that uh, the competent authorities need to carry out uh, in view of permitting cross-border transactions. Uh, cross-border mobility transactions, and in particular, to what extent uh, we can provide a definition to the term abuse, to the term uh, circumvention of national and uh, EU law, or what is a fraud for these type of transactions. Uh, frankly speaking, we don't uh, have answers so far, uh, which is uh, to some extent uh, something that uh, I'm happy about uh, because uh, in Italy we thought we were the only one <laughs> without a clear answer to these questions. But uh, I see that uh, um, to some extent in all member states we are going on together in this path to discover uh, what uh, an abusive transaction will uh, be uh, once the uh, transposition phase will be over. Um, we have also seen uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, the change of the rules regarding the protection of employees and creditors uh, will affect some member states more than others. But uh, uh, it seems that we are all uh, able to deal with these uh, new rules that have been introduced uh, by the new directive. And uh, we are also ready to give, uh, I would say, to full effect to these new rules. So uh, I believe that this uh, would have been more problem, but apparently it is not. And um, the last topic uh, that we touched was that uh, of uh, the role of the breeze in exchanging the documents and uh, the need of obtaining uh, apostilled uh, documents. Uh, it seems uh, that uh, uh, there is an issue that can be solved. But uh, for sure, uh, we would need to work hard in our national legal systems to find the practical solutions to ensure a prompt exchange of documents, because for sure we cannot block cross-border mobility transactions, because uh, we need a stamp that is missing. So uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, 
uh, first of all, uh, a list uh, that uh, took the time to join us uh, today, the organizers uh, at the CNUE, uh, the translators, uh, all the participants uh, uh, that took the time to listen to us uh, today, and the president uh, of uh, the CNUE that uh, introduced this uh, conference on the cross-border mobility uh, directive. I hope this is uh, just the first event uh, of uh, many others where we will have uh, this, uh, I would say, uh, exchange of ideas uh, on topics that are relevant, uh, not uh, only in single member states, but uh, across uh, uh, the European Union and uh, that are also important for the notarial profession. Thank you very much.